He was director of the National Ignition Facility for many years, which I think we'll hear a little bit about today, and contains the world's most energetic laser, so that fits in with some of the research done here in Waterloo. Um, but he's also managed a large number of other large-scale science projects, uh, including the atomic vapor laser isotope separation uh, uh, and, and developed methods to increase radi radiation treatment of cancer, so practical applications. Uh, he's won a number of awards, including the Jefferson Award, the Edward Teller, Teller Medal, Fusion the Power and Associates Leadership Award, and the list goes on and on, uh, including the Project Management uh, Institute Project of the Year Award, which I find particularly impressive for a project of that size. Uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the Optical Society, uh, the, the AAAS, uh, and a few others, uh, and is now, now uh, left the directorship of NIF behind uh, to pursue commercializing all of the fantastic uh, science that they've been doing there and, and maybe bring us into the 21st century with fusion power. Um, without further ado, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, um, presuming you can hear me, uh, I'm going to talk about the NIF and uh, progress towards ignition. Ignition is getting a fusion system that's actually burning, that's putting out more energy than you put into it. Um, and getting a propagating thermonuclear wave inside a DT capsule. So um, I'm going to talk about first, uh, you know, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, which uh, where I've been working for a long time. It's uh, outside of San Francisco. It's about, uh, in English units, a square mile. And uh, if you just go uh, east uh, from the airport for about an hour, you get there. And uh, the NIF, the National Ignition Facility, is in the corner with the circle around it. I want to tell you a little bit about the lab, if you don't know it. It's, it's around 7,000 people. Uh, <clears throat> if you look at it for the people who are the scientific and engineering staff, I think what's real interesting is uh, it's around 2,800 of us, uh, and about half have PhDs, a quarter masters, and the rest BS, except for a former director who didn't have any degrees, because he was so smart he was picked out sort of on the way through college and said, why don't you come out here and work? Um, and, but I think more importantly, from a d disciplinary point of view, it's really an interesting mix of engineers, physicists, computer scientists, chemists, mathematicians, uh, biologists, and, and actually uh, political scientists who uh, do all the missions. And because you have this mix, you can build projects like the NIF. It's uh, a little different than the Perimeter Institute, which is more theoretically grounded. Uh, our missions are global security, and stability, frontier science, clean energy, and of course, uh, training new scientists and engineers. And uh, this is what's been going on now since 1954 when it was founded. You know, it has broad capabilities. We have, uh, have had essentially continuously since uh, the 50s the highest power lasers and still do. Uh, we do earth and atmospheric sciences, chemistry and materials and laser science and technology. And recently, you know, we've been res uh, uh, involved in uh, um, finding, or producing, I should say, uh, six elements. And we're very proud that uh, element 116 is now called Livermorium, uh, f officially. So our town and our lab has an element named after it. Uh, we also do new planetary search, new species of hominids, and other things that are sort of not normally associated with, uh, with the lab, including biology, virology, and the like. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to be talking about the sun and a very small version of it. So uh, the sun took about 50 million years to initiate fusion, and the question is, you know, when, once it started coming together, how long will it take us to do it here on Earth? And uh, we're sort of 50 years in, and I think we're pretty close. So uh, again, in, in English units, sun is sort of a million miles across, and it has sort of a, a, a 10 to the fifth kilometer core that's burning. It has a, it's a slow burner, fortunately for us. I think it has the uh, uh, metabolism of a compost heap or so, but uh, if it had been any higher than that, we'd be, it would have gone out a long time ago. We would have never been here. We're trying to think about doing s stuff that's... Uh, you know, less than 100 microns across, and also one that'll burn very quickly. 
And when we talk quickly, we talk about picoseconds. So we're going from um, uh, a million years per reaction to pico picosecond reactions, actually much less than picosecond reactions. And the, scale, the question is, is how small can you make this? Um, because if you want to make it big, it's easier, but then you get a huge amount of energy gain, then you don't know what to do with it. The question is, how small can you make it and still have it stable and, and operate? And, um, you know, there's the sun. It's not doing deuterium and tritium, but deuterium and tritium are sort of the best ways to do this. They have, they have the highest cross sections that burn quickest, and you get, a, you know, a 3.5 MeV alpha particle out and a 14.1 MeV um, neutron out, and you get some other stuff out too, but this is what you're doing, and uh, you're turning a, a small amount of mass into a large amount of energy, and people are interested in this, you know, n not only for physics reasons, but for energy reasons. It's, it's a non-carbon system, and, uh, you know, it has about a million times the punch of a chemical reaction. So the laser was invented in 1960, and uh, literally uh, <clears throat> within uh, days after the first demonstration of the laser by Maiman down in Malibu at Hughes Aircraft, um, the laboratory, John Knuckles, who was that guy who never got his degrees, you know, thought about uh, how to use lasers to make very high pressure, high temperature systems and uh, get fusion to happen. But it's been a long battle because even though the ideas were there, most of them were wrong you know, because there wasn't a lot of understanding of the physics, and also there was no technologies to do it. It wasn't until the 70s that lasers got to a point where you could start building them. And our laboratory at Livermore, you know, has built uh, over the last uh, 40 years, you know, the, again, like lasers, like the computers, we've always had the highest energy lasers. And we went up about a factor of 10 uh, per, per uh, uh, serial number. Uh, over over time, and you know, in uh, in the late 90s, it was the sort of decided that NIF or the National Ignition Facility, if it were around a two megajoule UV laser, uh, it could get this to happen. So we went off to build it. And that was a big step. It was about a factor of 60 uh, increase in energy over any laser that had been built previously. It's not often that you do that kind of work. And this is what the NIF looks like. It's uh, we think it's the first laser capable of getting fusion gain, meaning more energy out than you put into it. And it's operational and underway. And if you take the roof off, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not one laser beam, it's 192 laser beams. And I'll show you why in a little bit, because you want to drive a spherical compression. Can't do that with one. It's in the ultraviolet because you want to, you know, tamp down laser plasma instabilities and interactions. It's high power because you want to move things really fast. And when we talk about fast, we talk about 400 kilometers per second. And, uh, <clears throat> and this is how we decided to do it. Now, this uh, technology is a technology of the 90s. And even though this laser is now operational at about a factor of 100 over anything that's operating today, uh, as a technology system, it's a little bit antiquated. But as a physics system, it, it is top drawer. And what's interesting to me is, even though this laser is about 100 meters square, uh, the target is, in the lower right, is about a centimeter uh, across. And what we love about laser light is it's, uh, you know, it's coherent. And so you can put a lot of energy and therefore a lot of power into a small, small space in a small time and uh, create pressures to drive these things. And that, that's how a target looks if you're a physicist. It's a nice, simple cylinder. I'll show you what's inside of it in a second. It has a little ball about two millimeters across filled with frozen DT. Um, but this is, how it, this is how the fusion system works. You know, you have that, a gold can, you know, which um, has a lot of electrons in it, so it keeps x-rays in. We have a capsule wall. This is two millimeters across made out of plastic or high-density carbon, otherwise known as diamond, and frozen DT in it. And we actually put the lasers in, and we don't hit the fuel. We use this as an oven. <clears throat> we raise it to around 300 volts in uh, about 5 nanoseconds, and then the x-rays bathe the target and ablate the, uh, the plastic, and it blows off, and it's a spherical rocket, and you move around 400 kilometers per second. When you get to around... Um, you know, 100 microns in diameter, 
if it stays round and it doesn't mix and, and you don't have other instabilities, you know, then you will be successful and it will burn. And, uh, and this is a simple version of it. And I think it's sort of uh, uh, useful to say you have this capsule wall you know, that's around 150 microns. Remember, a hair diameter is uh, 75 microns or so. And then you have this solid DT, and then you have DT cast inside, and you just push it in. And that's the problem <clears throat> right there. So you have to compress it about a factor of 40. Um, you know, a factor of 40 is hard to make anything happen and stay together. It, you know, Rayleigh-Taylor and uh, RM instabilities tend to make it come apart. And, and then you have mix of the ablator into the system, which cools it down by a radiation, or you just have a bad cylinder and it doesn't work. But if you can look at this as sort of a, a diesel engine, right? You just push on it until it gets hot enough uh, that it will light up at some place, and then the burn propagates out, and I'll show you how in a second. So there is the uh, there is a target, you know, looking from the laser's point of view down on it. It's around two millimeters across, and this is before it meets its maker. And uh, you know, we put a, around two megajoules of energy into this target in a few nanoseconds. And so you have around 500 terawatts focused at around 10 to the 14th watts per square centimeter. Now the, que the question is what stops the, the, the intensity from going higher? We actually make the laser less coherent and so we don't get higher intensities because then you would drive laser plasma instabilities because as it ablates, you get a, you know, a thick plasma inside the, inside the hull room or the oven and then you would have all kinds of uh, stimulated Raman, Brillouin, and other nonlinear processes. And actually, a lot of the light would just reflect right out, which would be very disappointing uh, after spending this much time. Now, I showed you what it looks like to a, uh, in, uh, to a physicist. This is actually how a, a real target looks uh, to an engineer who had to build it. And you can see that you know, this whole ROM is now vertically. The light is coming in from the top and the bottom. We have uh, all these holes in it so we can do diagnostics and see what's going on. And this Klingon warship look is to keep uh, stray radiation uh, from preheating the target and, uh, and making things not work so well. This uh, little uh, pipe that's coming in here is how you fill it up with liquid DT. So that pipe is around uh, 10 microns in diameter and you, uh, you know, use radiation, uh, <coughs> refrigeration pumping to fill it and then freeze it. This is how the laser light looks when it goes in, if it were perfect. Um, and I said it's 192 beams from, uh, from the laser, 96 on the top, 96 on the bottom. They go in, in four rings around it. And if you just do the math, you can see that these rings actually drive a spherical oven, you know, for modes uh, above about uh, Legendre modes above three. So you have to work on those other modes too. And they make the x-rays, the x-rays mix this up and, it, and uh, you have a very uniform drive. People talk about, well, why do, isn't there a better way to do this? Well, if you make a more spherical oven, then you have you know, more area. And if you have more area, you have more cooling and it doesn't work so well. You really want to pack it around um, the target. Uh, rugby's seem to be a better way, and we'll be, we're testing those now also. Now, <clears throat> this is an older view graph, but uh, the question is, uh, where are we? We've gotten, uh, right now we're up to around 28 kilojoules out of a target. Now, remember I told you we put one, one and a half to two megajoules in, 28 kilojoules out. Doesn't sound so good uh, in terms of the system, but when we look at it, and I will show you, if you look at how much energy is now into the the hot spot, you know, when it goes off, this is, we're now at a scientific break-even point, and I'll show you more about that later, where it's an actually a burning system. So how do you, how do, you do this? So here's a, a quick view of NIF. You know, you have these 192 beams. They're getting more and more energetic. The gain is around 10 to the 15th in the system. You go from two dimensions to three dimensions, and then you go into that cylindrical geometry and drive the target. That takes about a microsecond. So that's around a 300 meter path. And uh, if you, if you want to look at it a little bit more carefully, let me just lower the sound. This is, this, is, uh, this is how the countdown looks. It's a real place. 
Four, That's Glenn. He thinks he's three, doing something. Actually, the computers two, are doing everything. One, and now we'll go to, uh, you know, we'll go to again, uh, a cartoon of this. It's an electrical laser. It's plugged into the wall. It's a big plug. And uh, we start off at fiber optic technology. And, uh, you know, this is starting now at nanojoules on the way to megajoules. So we go to a preamplifier, you know, 48 of them. And then we go out into the, you know, the unit cell of the system is eight beams. Now the, the beam is 20 nanoseconds long, so it's around 20 feet or six meters long. And you can see it going through the laser glass, getting more and more energetic as it goes. The hardest part of NIF was to get the speed of sound and the speed of light identical. But we did it, as you can see. And so um, anyway, uh, so it plays music and it goes through this path. And now you see we go from eight beams to 48 beams, right? And then if you look to the <clears throat> your right, you see 96 beams. Same thing is going on on the other side of the building. And now we go from 2D to 3D. So you go from a plane to three dimension. And now you can see we wrap around. We're just looking at the bottom. The beams time up. Time up. They're infrared at this point. Miracle happens with nonlinear optics. We turn them ultraviolet to take care of the laser plasma instabilities. And we, a microsecond has gone by. Now we're going to slow down the clock a little more. And now you can see the oven that your expert's in right now. So the nanoseconds are going by. We're heating it up to uh, 300 EV. And we make this x ray bath and ablate the system and then drive it in. And we do this, and we do it pretty well. I mean, this is, there's been over 1,500 experiments of various kinds on the NIF since we turned it on in 2009. I know you guys are theoreticians, but I'm not. I, you know, I love dirt, so. So I just want to say it's a real thing. So this is how it is when you build real things. And, uh, you know, first you d dig a foundation, then you put it up. And this is how a laser bay looked when, you, you know, before the lasers went in. And you can see by these, um, you know, this is a standard liver moron up here, right? And, you know, you can see the scale of it. It's around 100 meters long, and you can see it's around uh, 20 meters high and 50 meters across, so a single laser bay. That's how it looks when it's together. And remember that eight beams, you know, that we saw the unit cell, you can sort of see them over here. You know, here's two die four, and that's six, that's that cluster. And then there's another bay of them. And the thing that's interesting about this, this sort of works. You know, it works every day in every way. And it's, it's, a, it's a low um, maintenance system. This is how it looks from on top. So if you come on a tour, and we allow Canadians in, so you're all welcome, <laughs> you know, this is, you can get to see all this stuff as it exists. And, and here you can see one bay of lasers. This is 96 beams. And, uh, and here's the target chamber. Now that target, remember, is two millimeters in a one centimeter, uh, in a one centimeter hull rom or oven, and uh, the target chamber is ten meters in diameter. And the reason that is is if you look at the f number of the of the optical system, that's how it comes out for this system. And also, there's so many X-rays and radiation coming off a target. You know, you would ablate the surface uh, significantly. So we had this scale. And so you can see this, this, and this is how the building looked before we put it in. Then we put it in gently, and that's how it looks now. Okay, so if you go to the NIF, which, you're, again, you're invited, you can see these uh, humans standing here. It actually is not blurry, because, you know, in real life, it, it's not stitch, there's no stitching problem. In the, and uh, there are floors, so we took the floors out, you know, so you could see the whole thing. But what's, what's the most interesting to me is the building is really a very large version of the target, right? So we built the building completely around the target. So it has the same uh, geometry and structure, and you can see there's a ball with laser beams coming into it. The scale is quite different. And this is how the laser beams look when they're coming in. And it, it sort of works, which is uh, amazing. When you're building these projects, you know, uh, you know how they are going to play out compared to how you plan them, it was very nice that this all works. Uh, I'm not going to spend time on this. I do want to say these optics are phenomenal. You know, they are working at about a thousand times the fluence 
without damage of any other optics in the world. But that's beside the point. This is what a target looks like in the center. So I, you know, you have that 10 meters. So right here, that little dot is a splash of the target. And all those beams that come in hit, hit that target within 30 microns of their, 30 microns RMS of their intended spot. And they do that within six picoseconds. So it's a very precision flamethrower. You can do great physics and you see diagnostics inside the target chamber. And uh, the diagnostics has now grown to uh, over 65. It's actually approaching 70. We do nuclear diagnostics, x-ray and optical diagnostics, and now we're putting proton diagnostics we ha uh, also, which are sort of a little uh, arguably in the nuclear, but not practically. And uh, they come from all over the world, not Canada yet. Hopefully someday they will. And uh, here's a gamma reaction history diagnostic uh, from Los Alamos or a, a magnetic recoil spectrometer from uh, MIT. Here's a Dante, an X-ray thermometer uh, from uh, AWE in, in, in Britain. So there's a lot of stuff in here that make it an experimental facility, a physics facility. Um, so I want to talk about a little bit how this all works. So this is a capsule implosion. And what we're looking at on the top is the radiation temperature in green and the pressure on the bottom in blue. And what we're watching is the nanoseconds go by and we're watching the plastic come in. And if you notice that little blue line, the ice, the DT, is thinning up. So this is sort of an, this is sort of an important issue. You know, how do you get this? I'm going to just play it again. You know, how do you play this? We have that gray is the ice, is the plastic, the blue is the ice. We want to pre-compress it without moving it. So we want to shock it up to a very high density because everything here is density. You know, that's what you're going for. And then we want to move it very rapidly. So what we do is we have this laser pulse in blue on the top. It's a very funny shape. You know, it has four shocks. And you can see the temperature of the oven going up with also four shocks. We're burning off the ablator. The ice is getting thinner. You can see it thinning up now. And then when we get to the fourth shock, uh, everything starts moving. And the acceleration is around 10 to the 14th uh, Gs. And so we move it in, and it just collapses in. And if it stays round, you know, you do work. And if you get it to burn exactly where it stagnates, you have a burning system. And then, of course, it, does, it comes apart and cools off. If you now just look at the edge, right, so if we're just examining this much more closely, you can also look that we're looking at density and entropy. You want to keep this a low entropy system, because if you don't keep it a low entropy system, it won't compress. But the problem with a low entropy system is unstable. So you know, we, sh we try to launch it on a reasonable adiabat. And you can watch the shocks coming in. You can see the ice, or the DT, it's not really ice, uh, moving, getting compressed. And when the shocks coalesce at the last second, that's how they're timed up, now you have the most compression, and it moves in. Now, when you watch the DT, the blue, you'll see it sort of oscillates. You know, and, and that is uh, this flapping that happens because you just can't keep it quite stable. And as it does, you know, you hope to get that timing just right, that it's its highest density when it gets to the center. And it stagnates right there. And now it's going to really get high, hot and start burning. OK, so that entropy trade-off is really important one. And, uh, you know, and shape is a really important one. So when I talk to kids, I always have them have a weather balloon. And actually, sometimes adults, because they have more fun. I always bring a weather balloon and say, so the first thing you want to do is make it go in round, right? Which is very hard, you know, that distance. And so we have a weather balloon and I hold up a, you know, a golf ball, which is about the 40 to one. I say, I tell these kids, could you make this balloon that size? And, you know, of course they push and pull and it, and it breaks. And that's the shape problem. This is actually not mixed, this is shape, right? So, so we lose the shape. Now, on the other hand, there's these high frequency components, you know, where the, you know, the plastic or the carbon will mix into the, to the hot fuel. And the thing that happens there, and this is classic uh, Rayleigh-Taylor, is that you now have carbon 
inside the hot fuel, it's getting hot. It's a great radiator, right? So it's just radiating energy out and it cools it, you know. And so you either have the first problem, you don't have a good piston, or you have the second problem, you have a, a, a system that's cooling. So how do you get around those, those things? So here's where we are, right? So if you look at it, you know, our best shots are within a factor of two from ignition conditions. Ignition conditions are ones where it's actually lit, it's self-heating. You know, you have the alpha particles that you're making are trapped in the hot spot, right? They're dumping their 4.3 MeV into that hot spot. The hot spot is now heating up, and the reaction rates, the thermonuclear reaction rates go way up with temperature, and now they beget more energy, and then it burns out into the cooler, uh, DT fuel that you have created around it. So this is around 100 microns across, and our specs are around 1,000 grams per cc, so a kilogram per cc um, for um, hydrogen. So that's about a, you know, 1,000 times out of water, you know, 100 times out of lead. That's a pretty interesting number. And, uh, and we're at around 500 grams per cc, and in the hot spot, you want to get up to around uh, 50 million degrees Kelvin or uh, 50 keV and 100 grams per cc. But the thing that's more important is the rho r or the aerial density because you know when you're watching an alpha particle go out, you don't really care about the three-dimensional effects. You really care about you know whether it'll scatter in inside and get trapped. And so we are now in a place where we're trapping alphas and showing heating. And this is this is a, a pretty interesting. If you're in our world, this is a you know, a factor of 10 better than anyone has ever done. So we're sort of on the verge here. But we've had these problems. Why doesn't it go up higher? And when we look at our diagnostics, you know, we have these shape problems and these instability problems. So this is, uh, you know, real data. And you can see that we have sort of this bagel, you know, you know a squarish bagel with a hole punched in it. You know, that's a shape problem. And this instability, you know, and every place there's a spike out, there's generally a spike in somewhere else. And uh, this is because the, ex the surface is, uh, is seated too large. Now, what we have found is that um, if you change the shape that we had, the original shape, which is in red right here, which is a low entropy, high compression pulse, to a higher entropy or a higher adiabat, and lower compression pulse that we have seen improvements in our performance, and I'll show you. So this was our original design to launch on a low adiabat, have a, a high in-flight aspect ratio, which means it's very thin compared to its radius, and converge a long way. So this is a more likely to burn system, but it's a more likely to be unstable system. So we've been studying these high foots or um, you know, this high picket in the front. And uh, just to show you what that looks like, um, this, is, this, is the, this is calculational, the difference between a low foot, you know, a low adiabat, and a high foot, a high adiabat instabilities. And it's really, you know, kind of different. Now, we didn't know this in, in the beginning because we didn't have experimental data on how this would do, and it was all modeling, and there was a lot to learn about this. So we did a lot of experiments on this, and I think this is kind of interesting because if you look at this here, we made a little target. Again, this is a, you know, a, a millimeter, and we put, we actually machined the sinusoidal modes into it, and then did experiments and calculate compared it to our calculations, and you can see how um, <clears throat> how these instabilities grow over time, you know, and they really dig in and, and get get very significant over time. And uh, this is the difference between a high foot, you know, a high adiabat, and a low foot, um, a low adiabat. And you can see the difference of how that mix is, is uh, uh, our instabilities are developing. And this is how it compares to our recent calculations, you know, a tuned up model. So we think we can model this, not really well ab initio, but getting there, you know, using a uh, uh, good, good modeling techniques and, and, and tying it to the data 
that, you know, the problems we were having. And it also shows that we were having problems in these uh, mode numbers of 100 or so, which were really driving those uh, high frequency instabilities crazy. Okay, so how are we doing? If we look at this curve, the measured yield versus the simulated yield, you know, uh, and the simulated yield is a 2D calculation. And, and these are good 2D calculations, the best we can do. 3D calculations take a couple of months uh, to get the resolution we want. So we have 1D, yeah. There are all kinds of modes. If you look at the, uh, if you look at the low modes, you know, low modes less than six, you have azimuthal and, and toroidal, and you have, uh, you know, you have, you know, you can do it like break them down by Legendre polynomials, P and M modes, and uh, the low frequency modes below six show up as shape. The other modes, starting around 20 to 100, start showing up as uh, mixing into the system, and uh, and. Yeah, so the, 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 the reason they peak, if you, look at the, if you look at the shape of the target as you make it and the uh, calculation of the uh, nonlinear instability, the laser plasma instabilities, this is where they sort of collect. Okay, so if you look at this, you know, there's a place, you know, that between 35% and 100% of, of 2D you should be able to burn. And uh, now you have to go up in velocity in order to make it happen. And these are a series of experiments we did. And I think this is an interesting you know, reality check. The blue was what we were doing at the, low, at the low foot. And this is what we thought was the right place to be. And we went up from around 10 to the 13th to uh, just under 10 to the 15th neutrons. But then when we tried to go to higher velocity, it just went down, right? And this was that mixing coming in. We thought it was shape at first. But we found out it was mixed. Then we went to the higher adiabat. We went here, and we're just moving up. So we were dominated by mix effects or high mode effects as we did this. Now, the problem with this is these don't compress as well. So the question is, how, how, how far up can you go? Or do you have to find some um, middle place? And uh, that's the, the conversation we're in right now uh, with Mother Nature. And uh, another way to look at it, if you look at the yield, these are the unscattered yield. You know, the yield comes uh, out at 14 MeV or so. Some, some go up in energy, some go down. But if you're around plus or minus uh, 14 MeV, put one MeV around that, you sort of see the uh, yield um, uh, that's n unscattered. If you multiply it by around 20 to 30 percent, you also include the scattered yield. But you can see as we went up in energy now, uh, we're going to higher velocities. And as we go to higher velocities, which is higher power, we're getting higher yield. And around 10 to 16th, we're at a place where we have significant alpha heating. And twice as much energy is coming out because of the work we've done than, than with the work we've, we are doing. At the same time, we're now finding that we can, we sort of have the shape problem. So, why do we have a shape problem? You know, it's sort of it's pancakey if you look at it this way. And that's because when we drive the targets, the, the whole ROM, it, it, the instability of the whole ROM because the plasma filling is now causing us to have more pushing from the top than from the sides. And so it's sort of flattening it out. And that shows up even more from the pole view. You can see that you're pushing from the top because it's actually punching a hole in it. There was some thinking that this was good um, because of, there's a huge, uh, huge uh, magnetic field in the system, and was this, you know, trapping electrons from diffusing out and cooling the hot spot? Um, but this is just conjecture at this point. You know, this wasn't a plan; it just was true. But we've noticed that the pole seems, uh, the hole in the pole seems to be useful. So this is the hot spot model. So we have this toroidal shape. And, uh, you know, our approach is now what to do with that to get move, keep moving up. Well, one of the things you could do is go to depleted uranium whole ROMs. You know, depleted uranium has a higher albedo uh, in the x-rays, and so it's uh, 
it sort of pumps up the energy around 35 terawatts or 10 percent without putting more in. And thinner capsules, you know, if you don't have mix, you know, if you have a stable ablation front, then you don't have to worry about having thick capsules, which would, pr which would allow penetration of the, of the ablator into the fuel. And we've done some experiments on that, and that, that's working very nicely. So uh, we did these experiments, and you can see how we've taken ourselves up to this new place of 10 to the 16th neutrons. Again, 10 to the 16th neutrons, if you're not into, into it, is around 30, 30 kilojoules. 30 kilojoules compares to around 10 kilojoules of work done on the hotspot. And the thing that's nice about this, you know, for a few hundred more uh, EV, we're around 4.8 uh, kilovolts right now, temperature of the hotspot, it'll sort of just self-burn. It'll just take off and burn. And here's the latest experiments we've done that show we are getting control of both the shape and of, um, of the uh, a mix at high, high gain. Now, here's where we're going to be looking with DU and other, uh, other materials. Our goal is to use less energy and less power to get to the same place. Therefore, you have more headroom in the system to go up in, in where we want to do it. And, and here is you know, the history of the experiments that we have. And you can see in the high foot regime, or excuse me, the low, low foot regime, we sort of had a tough time for a year trying to sort of sort through this. But now we're just sort of moving up very rapidly. These experiments that look lower were actually good experiments. They were to check that, they were to check that what we were seeing here was sensible. You know, so we went off normal to do that. But this is where we are. And this is going to be uh, work that's published pretty, pretty soon. It's going, to go, it's going through an internal peer review right now to do this. This will be the first time uh, that anyone has cre created conditions in any fusion system, uh, any laboratory fusion system, where these conditions have been met. And that's the difference, what we look there. It's hydrodynamic instabilities. Here's, how that, here's another way to look at that. You know, we're just going up. And I think a more interesting way of doing it is this way. If you look at the compression yield uh, versus the burn yield, you can just see the system lifting off. And you can think about this, again, as a, an engine, right? You're just doing work, and now you're going to thermonuclear burn instead of chemical burn. So we're very excited about this. And this grows very rapidly. For another two kilojoules in, you'll get into a burn situation. And this is how that looks. OK, you know, <clears throat> before I go on, I mean, and I know this was a lot since this is not your field exactly, is my understanding. Do you have any, uh, anything, any questions or anything you want to talk about with respect to this? Remember, it's a laser driving a rocket, a rocket driving uh, th you know, a compression wave, putting energy into that. and. Say that again, I just didn't hear it. Is there anything to do with the materials Yeah, so the, the capsule issue is, uh, the, so there's, there's uh, several things you can do. Um, you know, um, I, I, I was going to talk about this, but I didn't think we have time. One of the things you have is, well, we use plastic. You know, plastic has carbon and hydrogen in it. Um, you know, and when you have those two together, you have unstable abla ablation fronts. That's why we have to go to a lower system. If you look at beryllium and uh, high-density carbon, which is a uh, diamond, but it's not like you hog out a diamond, you know, you evaporate it onto the system. Our early experiments show that the, uh, the rocket is around 40% more efficient, which is an incredible number. Um, because that's, think about 40%, of, 60 percent of the energy from the laser will get you the same performance. But more importantly, if you have that, you now can have shorter pulses. If you have shorter pulses, it's less time for the plasma to penetrate in. You know, the plasma moves at a couple hundred kilometers per second off the walls and off the ablation front. And you have less time for that to happen. And now you have a higher efficiency uh, um, uh, drive from that point of view also. Also, beryllium is a better ablation blader than plastic. 
trouble with the beryllium, we don't, we really don't want to get involved with it until we have to, um, because there's so many regulatory issues and safety issues with beryllium. So it should be better, and we're getting ready to do beryllium. The other thing is, you know, uh, going from gold hull ROMs to uranium hull ROMs has been very exciting. And uh, there's other, what we call cocktails, like dysprosium, dysprosium, uh, uranium, gold hull ROMs that even are more efficient. So there's many things you can do. And finally, there's the rugby hull ROMs. Rugby's are interesting because you main, you know, you can get uh, the same drive for less area, so you have less cooling uh, in the oven itself. And so there's many, many things we can do here. Four rings on top and four rings on the bottom. <clears throat> okay, so if you if you look if you look at the you know if you look at the beams uh, coming if you look at the rings the beams coming in, um, you know you have the outer the outer pairs and the inner pairs, right? The inner pairs drive towards the um, drive towards the uh, equator of the shell. The outer ones look back. So the question is, well, why don't you do eight or ten or twelve or, you know, why don't you have a thousand laser beam, right? Well, rings is easy because you want to have an azimuthal as close to azimuthal symmetry as you possibly can, and so you try to make the the spot sizes such that as they ring, go around, they pretty much overlap, right? You know, they just touch each other, touch each other, touch each other. And you take pictures of it, and you see these beautiful rings of X-ray radiation. So you want the azimuthal part that way. But you could say, well, I, if I had a, th why don't I do a thousand laser beam, right? So that's a, that's a huge debate. That was a huge debate when we were building it. You know, um, you know, there was the 192 laser s beam system. There was the 242, 240 laser beam system. There was many others. It ends up that if you look at eight-fold symmetry versus 10-fold symmetry, 12-fold symmetry, you're sort of, getting what you want for the complexity of the system you're building. So this is sort of an engineering reality trade-off. Uh, people have pointed out that, you know, if you had a million laser beams, it would be better. It actually isn't. And the reason that is is because the cross-coupling of the laser beams in the plasma gets extremely complicated. Remember, you have a plasma that's flowing out at very high velocities, and the beams interfere in there and put, you know, drive a grating into the system. And then they start coupling energy back and forth. We use that to balance the, you know, the top beams from the bottom beams in the rings. But you, know, you don't want to, if you try to have too much control of it, you, do, you just don't. 192 beams is, so the world has come to that conclusion. The French wanted, it started to build a 240 beam system, but they've come back to uh, actually 160. <clears throat> okay, so the up conversion going from infrared to UV changes during the pulse. You know, at the beginning of the pulse, it's around 30%. At the end of the pulse, where you have the big peak, it's around 85%. During, during the overall energy conversion, it's around 55%. Uh, but you can, uh, and that is for this laser. This laser is a very, uh, it has to work on a lot of different experiments for a lot of different people. If you just wanted to design it for this pulse, you could get 75%. It's a really very efficient process. By the fusion reaction? Yeah. Well, there's uh, several ways. We have uh, a whole bunch of neutron counters, right? Uh, that are, you know that are looking at it, and we have them as as imaging counters. We have uh, activation counters. We have several. There's around 11 different types of ways we look at that, and we also uh, we also um, look at other things so that we make sure that there's self consistency, the temperature of the reaction. We look at X-rays coming out. We look at downscattered uh, neutrons and look at the cross sections of those. So there's a whole pile of things that we have put together to look at them. But neutron counting, finally, in, in neutron activation diagnostics are the best. You have, we have about 50 of them inside the system. We pull them out and just go count. Well, those are the ones you have to wait for. And uh, about a week later, 
they, those guys report exactly what we had. We usually know within a 10%, you know, within a few hours. Should I go on a little bit? Okay, so I did want to talk about what I'm doing right now, you know, which is fusion energy. Could you make this happen? You know, you know if you look down on our world during the day, you know, you can hardly tell we're here, right? There's no obvious signs of human presence, at least at this resolution. You know, but at night, it's uh, quite the difference, right? You know, you can see everything. We're all over the place. And, uh, and you, know, we're, you know, we're just, uh, we are everywhere, and, you know, we're really using a lot of energy. And I, I find the day and night story, you know, night and day. You know, it just sort of tells what's going on that you can't see. And... Uh, you know, this whole idea of we may be at a tipping point at our, of our planet, you know, I, I, I mean, it's, it's an act of faith that it's not a good situation from my point of view and many point of view because, you know, if you look at this, there's going to be another 3 billion people. We're ballistic for another 3 billion people uh, in the next 30 years, barring a, a catastrophe. You know, it, it's unstoppable. And, and just to remind you, 3 billion people is the uh, amount of people in North America, uh, China, and India. And those people are being born in places where they don't have a lot of energy. They're energy starved. They're not like us. And so it's, it's, it's a worse situation. Greenhouse gases are rising. You know, the whole story is uh, sort of coming apart. Uh, so, you know, I think our problem say, statement for our species is to create safe, environmentally sustainable energy. We live on energy. Our measure of standard of living of energy is energy. Everything here today on a snowy day is energy. So it, it's an important story. The thing is that's also the scale of this problem is, is sort of a, it, it's, it's incredible. You know, right now, uh, a mega project like building a big, coal-fired plant or nuclear power plants is 1,000 megawatts, right? You know, if you look at all the power we're going to have to build by 2050, it's 10,000 1,000 megawatt plants. And that's because of all the energy we have today is going to be retired out by, t by 2050, every, every single bit of it, you know, because a lot of it is like 40 years old right now worldwide, and it's going to be doing that. So what are we going to do? I mean, what are we going to do with that 10,000 megawatts? Now, it ends up this little fuel pellet is 40 kilowatt hours, you know, from a milligram pellet of deuterium and tritium. Um, and that's less than one gram of fuel per person per year for the entire energy needs. So for a city like uh, Toronto, you need uh, 1,000 liters of water a year. You know, that's it. And Toronto is a pretty energetic city. And um, so the whole idea of if we get this gain to happen, how would you do this? You know, NIF is a single shot system, but what if you made it a multi shot system, you know, like an engine? And, uh, you know, this is one hertz. Let's say you made it 10 hertz, right, which is 600 RPM. And if you had NIF with a gain of uh, 30 or so, you're now into a megawatt, a gigawatt class electrical system. And the question is, could you do that? You know, could you take NIF, which is a physics performance machine, and turn it into an engine? Now, there's, there's a lot of questions here. You know, could you make the lasers more efficient? Could you make targets 10 times a second? You know, what would you do with these neutrons? Where would you get tritium, right? And the answer is, they're all pretty simple. I mean, uh, the lasers that I'll show you we're building right now are, are 40 times more efficient than NIF uh, because they're using laser diodes. They're going to the solid state, solid state instead of having flash lamps. Now, you can get tritium if you just have in your cooling pipes, you have lithium, right? So the neutrons, you know, interact with the lithium and make tritium. So it's like driving down the street in your car and it's, it's making gasoline. That's, that's a nice idea. And the whole idea of making these targets at uh, 10 a second is, you know, we've actually talked to many manufacturers uh, who have already demonstrated, you know, making the whole ROM, you know, it looks a little bit like a bullet and stamp them out, you know, at that rate and, uh, <clears throat> and, and doing this. And so 
You know, I, I've been working on life, laser inertial fusion energy, which is an integrated approach to a plant design. You know, my question is, you know, when I started thinking about this three years ago, assuming NIF works, assuming burn, and assuming gains of 20 to 50, which are, seem reasonable, you know, they're not, they're not outrageous, doesn't take the target any bigger than we have, doesn't look like it takes a laser any bigger. Uh, it has to be directly based on NIF performance. It has to use technologies that are available today, so you can't have unobtainium or something like that. Uh, it has to be modular and factory built. You know, NIF is a beautiful machine, but it was built in place, the first order. Now, now you have to have it so it's modular and you ship it and bolt it together. And uh, it's, it's e easy to license. Now, one of the things that's good about fusion, it's not like a, a fission machine where, you know, you've already created the conditions and the enrichment that you can have unfortunate incidents. You know, no one thinks that the hydrogen in this room is going to collect over there at 1,000 grams per cc, let alone tritium and deuterium, because there's no tritium here and very little deuterium. And, you know, it's, it just won't happen. The worst that can happen is nothing happens. So uh, it's, it's safe. It looks like it's licensable. And the question is, could you make technologies? Now, there's NIF today, right? If you look down, this is a picture. And we've started to build a laser that takes all of, all of a beam line of NIF and puts it in a box nine meters by uh, two meters by one and a half meters. And, and this is not as small as it could go. And its efficiency is about 40 times what NIF is. And its rep rate goes from once every 10,000 seconds to 10 times a second. We've built this at quarter scale. So, you know, the, the question is, could you do this in the next 10 or so years, show there's a way so that in the 20s, when things really have to start changing, you would have a technological system that was based on valid physics that you could have a carbon-free system that was not, you know, not a proliferant technology that was based on a growing, ever-growing semiconductor industry and nanotechnology and industry. And, and, and I think the answer is yes. You know, my, my commitment to this is I resigned from this job where I was sort of managing uh, <clears throat> 1,500 people and, you know, a, f a 400 million U.S. budget annually to do this. And there's a lot of people who are interested in it, including utilities worldwide, you know, power companies, semiconductor business, and the like. We also had the National Academy study, uh, U.S. National Academies, into inertial fusion energy. And uh, very... Um, happy, uh, I was very happy, they came back with a compelling, they, that we have a compelling rationale for this, uh, you know, the, that uh, concluding that ignition on NIF was achievable, and we should plan to do this. So that's what I'm doing. And I sort of left the lab, not sort of, you know, um, to take a sabbatical at, at Berkeley to uh, start working on this. The reason I did that is I wanted to take it out of the weapons environment, I wanted to take it out of the advocates environment to an academic environment where the discussion could be had, you know, from all parties, you know, from all over the world without, you know, badges and things like that, you know, and that, I think that's a really important step. I think this is an affirmation of our vision and something I want to do. So if you look at it, you know, over the last 15 years, we've gone from a concept for NIF to an operational NIF. And I think the um, life story is, is interesting because as a project builder and a technologist, uh, and I have a lot of experience in that, I look at the risks associated with when I started working on NIF much higher than the technical risks associated with life. We didn't know anything. We didn't have any of the technologies. We didn't have glass. We didn't have the nonlinear crystals, control system, target technology. We didn't have the ability to calculate now, this was a real high-risk project, whereas I think life is the kind of thing that in, in industry can do. It can be taken out of a national lab environment and make this happen, as long as you have access to NIF to make the performance better. So this is my goal, you know, using NIF to get a market entry plan to get a mature life technology and, of course, world domination. But forgetting that... <laughs> You know, but I think the story here is it could be a part of the portfolio that people use. 
And the thing that I th also think is interesting, it can't get more expensive. You know, every single part of it will get less expensive, just like your flat panel TV. Remember, you spend the same amount of money for it every year, they just give you more and more, right? So when you, when you buy that, and, and that's because Moore's Law is established, and the Moore's Law for this kind of technology is actually a little bit more rapid because it's early in, the, in its maturation cycle. So I think that this uh, could be a, a very exciting story uh, for all of us you know, in the future. And I'm not the only one. You know, while the US is leading this, <coughs> the Chinese are building a, a, a facility called Divine Light, you know, which is a better name than NIF, but it is NIF. Uh, the Russians are doing the same thing. The French are doing this. The Europeans are sort of trying to figure out what to do with the French right now. The UK works with us. Japan and Korea are, um, are, are, are active in this. And so if you look at the world, this is actually a very large subterranean um, effort. You know, and, it's, and, it's, and it's very large because of all the applications it has and also because energy comes along for free. So that, that's uh, one story. Um, another story I want to tell you because of where we are, you know, NIF is a great fundamental science machine. You know, there are experiments going on on NIF on neutral, neutral pair plasmas uh, for positron electron pair plasmas, neutral ones, can you do that, which is uh, post Big Bang physics, collisionless shocks, you know, which is interstellar space type issues, low energy neutron spectra, you know, uh, Rayleigh Taylor instabilities and in astrophysics, uh, compressed diamond structures, and the like. So there's just a lot of work, and radiative supernova, Rayleigh Taylor is also stuff that we're doing. So there's a lot of experiments on the NIF that are just fundamental science, and they just slop back and forth between the ignition program and this, and, and the kind of diagnostics, the kind of experimental capability that people have. And uh, it's kind of amazing. We've been to the center of Saturn, you know, and, uh, you know, we go from, you know, Earth-like conditions or, or to the center of Saturn in four nanoseconds, where if you calculate it, it's faster than the speed of light, and get, and get conditions that exist there. You know, it, we're now pretty sure that center of Saturn is just a, is a gigatons of diamonds. Um, and uh, we're about to go to Jupiter, too. Uh, we've been to the center of the Earth. You know, you know, iron uh, is on, at the center of the Earth. Is you know, this is kilovolt chemistry. It's not the same as the iron we know. And uh, we're now working on gigabar experiments uh, to really test quantum quantum effects in solid state materials and what how they how they uh, form up as over time. Because the whole idea of the bond structures that we think exist are clearly wrong. At, at these pressures and temperatures. So our goal is also to make NIF a premier international center for experimental science and to you know, challenge quantum mechanical models of uh, solid state matter at extreme conditions. So this is all going on. So this is kind of an exciting place to be. There's, this is a picture. If you saw the last Star Trek, and if you, you know, you know, NIF was actually the star of the last Star Trek. You know, you know, we were in it for at least 45 minutes. So if you want to see what NIF looks like, go, go. You could see the good ship, the bad ship, everything. It was all done in NIF, and they, they gave us, you know, that whole joke. All I got was a T-shirt. <laughs> That's what we got from Paramount, a T-shirt. So this was this is the NIF team saying uh, hello. This is around a thousand of us, and uh, thank you for your time. If you have any questions. <clears throat> if you have any more questions, uh, I'm here. I think usually the uh, tradition is to let any students ask uh, the first uh, questions. By the way, that is all we got. Um, so. You say this oven, you make it out of gold, um, and how are you going to be, you're going to be making like 10 of these a second or something, isn't that going to, aren't you going to need a, a lot of gold for this? Isn't that going to get oh, very okay. expensive? Okay, so the question is the gold problem. So, um, well, first of all, you don't really need a lot of gold. 
but you know, there's a, a few milligrams of gold in, in this. Remember, it's plastic coated with gold. You only need a few microns thick to uh, you know, reflect the x-ray, so it's not a lot. But there's a real problem with gold besides that. You know, gold has a very high temperature melting point, right? So when you would have the, uh, you know, the fusion explosion, it would blow out the hull rom, the gold. It would fly out atomistically, and it would go to cool places inside the oven, right? And, then, and over time, it would plate out, and you would have a gold-plated oven. You know, it, wouldn't, it would just condense, and it, it would be very expensive. So you don't want to do that. You know, so uh, well, what would you do? Well, you would want something with a low melting point that has a lot of electrons, so it you know, reflects uh, uh, x-rays. So then you say, well, what about lead? You know, lead would be good because lead is going to be, uh, um, has a, a lower melting point than the temperature of the wall. So even if it got out there, you would, it would then just sort of melt. You know, it would just flow down, and you could have a plug at the middle, you know, and it just dripped out the bottom. And, th and that's a good idea, uh, except some of the lead will become dusty, right? It'll be, you know, and it'll just sort of crap up. The, let me say it differently. It'll just, over time, you know, it'll get in places where it doesn't uh, drain out. So there's a lot of uh, research we're doing into, uh, you know, krypton and other types of whole ROMs, which would always, re it'll go from the solid state to the gaseous state, and you can just pump it out. But you know, gold would be a bad idea from a, a system point of view, not from a cost point of view. And lead is a good, almost a good idea, and we're just looking at other things too. Is that your question? Are there uh, any other student questions? So it takes a few nanoseconds to do a run, but you know. Uh, but you know, the question is, how often do we do them? And uh, you know, so we have four clients, you know, to the NIF, you know, which is the weapons program, fundamental science, the ignition program, and then there's another client that I don't want to talk about. But anyways, and they all want their time, right? And so we generally do. Uh, about a half the time goes to the ignition program, but not all of their shots are ignition shots. They're shots like uh, looking at these instabilities, laser plasma, Rayleigh Taylor instabilities, and you know it's called focus science experiments to understand phenomenology. And so uh, we do a, um, a, a burn shot about once every three weeks. Everybody. I had a couple of questions. Uh, can you explain when alpha particle and the neutron are formed, uh, uh, do, do you have a possibility of uh, sort of uh, uh, harnessing the kinetic energy of neutrons, or it's mostly alphas? I mean, for practical No, no actually, you, you, what you use, wh what happens is the alphas are used to heat up that's right. The hot spot to create more neutrons and more alphas, of course, because you know every fusion reaction results in. Remember, D plus T equals an alpha plus a neutron plus some X rays and gammas, right? So, so it's it's a self-perpetuating machine. Now, the neutrons just fly out. You know, they're to first order. They scatter a little bit, but they just go out, and you capture that kinetic energy uh, by scattering it. You know, by scattering it in lithium or something like that. So it's sort of like throwing a snowball at a wall, right? You know, you but most of the neutron energy will be lost, right? Or is it, is no, it not? No, no, it's not lost. It's uh, actually, it just scatters and it's trapped inside the lithium and heats up the lithium. And, you know, if you were, in, okay, let me just say, in NIF, it just goes out and heats up walls and stuff. Right. You know, the walls are three, six feet thick or two meters thick. So no, we don't pay attention to it except where there's a diagnostic and we, we count them going by. Uh, but in a power plant, you would just capture them in the lithium, you know, con convert kinetic energy into thermal energy, thermal energy into electricity or whatever you want to do. The alpha particles, you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, are, you know, finally ionized. You have a low pressure gas in it, and you have a thermal wave that goes out in the low pressure gas, and you capture that the same way. Okay. 
Uh, I also had a question about the uh, all these uh, worldwide uh, projects that you showed uh, towards the end of your talk, about 10 of them. Uh, are they all using the same basic idea of... Uh, yeah, the ones I showed were all um, uh, to first order using the same idea. There's, you know, this, what I've talked about is indirect drive, where you don't actually fire the laser at the fuel. You fire it into an oven, turn it into, uh, convert it into x-rays, and that's called an indirect drive system. There are some ideas called direct drive where you actually put the lasers fired onto the capsule itself. And the, the challenge of that is, you know, be like if you, you know, tried to cook a turkey or something like that with blow torches in there, it's, it's really hard to make it a uniform uh, implosion. People say, some people claim, well, it's more efficient because you don't have the inefficiency of the oven, right? And you're just putting it in. But it ends up the nonlinear effects optical the nonlinear optical effects in the on the on the surface or right are are strongly coupled to the system and they cause you know hot electrons and other things other phenomenology that de degrade the performance but almost everyone is doing indirect there is some direct drive work if, i think if i'm answering your if i'm not answering your question any other questions All right, so, so I had one question about uh, how clean this is. So you, you said uh, you don't have any of the nasty stuff that goes into fission reactors, but you do have all these fast neutrons and, and whatnot uh, blasting through the stuff around it. Does that create nasty byproducts that you okay, have to so worry about? Okay, so there's two things in a, you know, in a uh, fusion system that you have to deal with. Uh, the first one is tritium, right? Because tritium is radioactive. and and there's not much of it. So you have to be able to make tritium. And I've told you how we make it. You know, we just make it in place and you sort of don't, that's a very nice idea because it's a closed fuel cycle right in the plant. Um, that, that's good. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, you have tritium. And tritium is a gas and it's a, it's a hydrogen gas and it tends to leak out of everything. And so you have to have a management uh, process, you know, an engineering process to manage the tritium from getting out. It ends up with the way we're doing it, you know, we've uh, started doing studies with uh, uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission is that, you know, we have a design process that even if all the tritium were somehow released, which it cannot be because it really, tritium gets into stuff, it doesn't want to leave, you know, uh, um, you would not have, you could have a one kilometer uh, size plant and boundary and then the public would be safe even in the quote unquote catastrophic uh, event, meaning that all tritium somehow got released. Now the next thing that comes up is, okay, you have these neutrons flying around, what's, something's going to get activated, right? You know, and if it gets activated, it's radioactive, it's radioactive, what do you do with that? And the answer is, um, there are, um, there's a lot of work in uh, different kinds of steels so that you don't have, um, you know, impurities that cause activation and, you know, just bring that way down. And it, you could buy steel now that you could use in the system that you would have very short lifetime, shallow ground burial type work and you would uh, could handle it relatively soon, three to six months after it came out and just uh, shallow ground burial. And that, that's what people think. So it, it's, that's there, but it's, it seems very manageable. And compared to coal or anything else, the, the amount of radiation that's coming out of this is incredibly small. People don't realize that coal and oil and gas, when you're burning them, are, you know, are incredibly, relatively radioactive, you know, with radon and, and other materials that are pouring out all the time. So unless there are uh, any other burning questions, let's thank uh, Ed again. Okay, thanks for coming by. Ahem. <clears throat>